Just to give you a very quick overview of what I'd like to talk about tonight is we're going to talk about courts and uh, specifically some of its uses in the electronics industry. We're going to talk about the origins of the, the quartz crystal industry in Colorado, how it came to be here. The industry is, I hate to say it, but pretty much over so we can put it in context from start to finish and talk about how it, it, it went over the years. Well, I'll talk about the individual companies that were here, and that will open it up for questions and comments. Now, I will say that there's more information in the book that I did on the quartz industry of, of Cumberland County, and let me give you a little background about that. Carlisle was the crystal capital of the world. We've all heard that, right? How many of us knew what, it, what that meant? And how many people in Carlisle knew what that meant? The crystal industry was kind of quiet, and contained and it, it never made waves, I guess would be the way I would, would put it. Um, where other industries tended to get a little more publicity. So we knew it was a, the crystal industry. Back about 2000, a friend of mine worked at, at Hoffman Materials. I was in the insurance industry and I stopped by on a visit and we got to talking and, and he said, somebody should write a history of the crystal industry in Carlisle. And I said, yeah, that'd be a good idea. I hope somebody does that. <laughs> And about two years ago, I was here, and there's a gentleman by the name of Tim Boyd who works here, he was in the crystal industry, and he said, you ought to do a history of the crystal industry. <laughs> I said, yeah, I should, I guess. I don't know anything about it. I belong to a, a scouting group at Reeves Hawking for a couple of months, so I've been in a crystal factory, and I've been in Hawking materials, and that's the extent of my knowledge of the crystal industry. So I set about through newspaper research, and I had the good fortune to know a couple people that I got to talk to that I was able to, I think, prepare a summary of the history of the crystal industry. I'm not a crystal manufacturer, I'm not an electronics expert, so it's kind of an overview. There are a lot of experts in the room tonight. People that I know, for example, were executives of the crystal industry. Some of you have experience that I don't have. Please be gentle with me tonight. <laughs> So what I'm, I'm here to share is, is what I found, and I, I want to start and give credit to a guy who's been kind of neglected over the years. In 1962, they did a community-wide celebration of what they called the 30th anniversary of the crystal industry. We'll talk about that in a minute. And there was a big article appeared in the Evening Central, uh, Evening Sentinel in October of 1962, and that article was written by Wilbur Maxwell. His name was very small at the bottom, but what's happened is, if you start to do research on the crystal industry in Carlisle, in the United States, you're gonna come back and you're gonna see people that copy Wilbur's article verbatim and never give him a lick of credit. And he's been cheated, and I just wanted to recognize him. He worked with the crystal industry, he was in human resources and labor relations, he was a, uh, an HR person and he never got the recognition. Most of the materials that we have in our collection here were donated by Wilmer. So, um, just to give credit. Another person that did a fair amount of work in the 1970s was Patricia McCommons, who did a project for Dr. Gates at Dickinson College and wrote a rather extensive paper and did interviews with a lot of people that worked in the crystal industry, and they're on file here as well. So, um, I just want to, to give Wilmer some, some credit where it's due there. So, again, I'm not a geologist, but quartz is a crystal. What crystals do we deal with every day in our lives? Sugar. Salt. Sugar, salt, or crystals. Quartz crystals have certain characteristics that we'll talk about in a minute. The crystal, the quartz that, that are, is used in quartz manufacturing for the most part, in the early parts of the crystal industry, came from Brazil. And the quartz is deposited as liquid flows through certain rock formations, and as it does so, it is deposited in a very structured, uniform way, not perfectly, but in a structured, uniform way, that creates a property we call piezoelectric. And I'll touch on this a couple times, but as it works out, if we put electricity in one side of a piece of quartz, and we capture that electricity that comes out the other side, it comes out at a frequency that's determined by the quartz crystal 
that it goes through. I'll, I'll try and explain this a little bit better. But initially, the, the crystal that we get and we talk about, especially during World War II and in the 1950s, is naturally occurring in quartz that was mined in Brazil, a couple of places in eastern Brazil, and it was brought to the United States to be turned into uh, what I would call crystal units. In later years, they developed synthetic quartz, which actually was grown in autoclaves, and they, they were grown in Colorado. I'll touch again on that in a little bit. But it's a naturally occurring material. It's a material that we can also produce synthetically that has, as I say, the piezoelectric effect. The piezoelectric effect was discovered in the 1880s by the Curies as they worked on research and radiation. Nobody realized the value of that until about World War I, and the Europeans in the late 1910s started to do some research to try and detect submarines using piezo crystals, kind of early form of sonar. In the early 1920s, circuits were developed that made the use of quartz crystal for frequency control practical. So it took about 40 years till it was first made practical. And it didn't become widely used for frequency control into about the 1930s. And what we're going to see is a lot of the initial work that's done to develop crystal and quartz crystals for radio frequency control is done by amateur radio operators or ham radio operators. And that's going to have a pretty significant impact on our story in just a minute. And they started to become widely used for frequency control in the 1930s. Now, you think about this, the 1930s is a, a long, long time ago, but by late 1930s, locally, we had police departments that had radio telephones in their car. Prior to that, the only way you got a police officer was to fly them down in the street or go to the police station on the square and hope somebody was there. Now we could call and they could respond. And that was a pretty big technological advance um, in the 1930s. In the early 1940s, the US military decided to use crystals for radio frequency control, just prior to World War I. Now, prior to that, radios were tuned by a large, a variable capacitor, metal plates. And what would happen if you tuned the radio to, say, a certain frequency, with time, there would be drift, temperature change, it would drift off frequency. And you'd have to get it in. None of you people are old enough to remember, but when I was a kid, we had AM radio stations. And you could get Chicago in the middle of the night, but it would drift, and then you'd have to go retune the read. Well, that's not real handy if you're in the middle of combat in an airplane and you want to talk to another guy. And that's where crystals came into play and where they developed. Now, what happens is that spurs a lot of growth in the crystal industry, and because of a couple of fortuitous events, Carlisle's position to really thrive as, as that takes place. Now, when we talk about quartz and its manufacturer, it's simple in theory, but it's devilish in the details. And I think I have a couple of people that have worked in the quartz industry when I, I, I see those faces. But a couple of things that it, it, we have to know about quartz or to think about is that it has three axes, the X, Y, and the Z axes, and there's some quartz on display in the cabinet over here. In order to properly cut that quartz, you have to determine the axes of that piece of, of rock or stone and then decide how you're going to cut it. And this might be a little bit difficult to see, but we cut at different angles to produce different crystals. There's an AT cut, a BT cut, a CT cut, an SC cut, a lot of other different cuts. And depending on the angle of the cut and the accuracy of the cut depends on the, the determines the quality of that crystal for frequency control and other uses. So that was originally done by putting the piece of crystal of quartz into an oil tub and shining light through it, which isn't very accurate. But in Carlisle, very early on, they developed X-ray diffraction, and you now put that piece of quartz onto the X-ray machine, and it's attached to a metal plate, and there's fine screws that adjust that so we can get the axes determined and then we take that plate and mount it on a saw, and then we start to cut that large piece of crystal into smaller pieces that get ground down to the final frequency. Is everybody okay so far on the, the theory? Is you, you, you take a big piece and you make small pieces, and depending on the cuts, you get, get different qualities. What your ultimate goal is, 
is to come up with a crystal wafer. This is an actual quartz crystal unit that's been cut apart. And if we look at it, the translucent or milky colored piece, the larger piece, is the quartz crystal. There's electrodes. You see a coating on both sides. One pin of this goes into this side. The electricity goes through the crystal, comes out the other side. As the electricity goes through, it causes that piece of crystal to vibrate at a set frequency based on the mass of that piece of crystal. It's extremely accurate for the most part. There was a problem called aging in World War II at the beginning when we, we cut the crystals and we didn't clean them enough. They get into service, especially in warm human atmospheres like the, the China Burma Theater, and little specks would fall off the crystal and the frequency would change. And that became a bit of an issue. But for the most part, it produces very accurate, very consistent frequency control. Now, again, I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying. But the whole purpose of the industry that we're talking about is taking pieces of that raw quartz crystal and manufacturing it down into small pieces and then assembling it into different units. Now, this is a, to me, simple quartz crystal that would go in a radio. That particular case is probably a, a fire radio um, from the 1950s or 60s. And that's, that's pretty straightforward. That becomes part of a bigger circuit and that will become part of our, our, our story later. But that's basically what we're talking about. And again, I know many of you are familiar with that. The local plants that we had did cutting. You can see a picture of cutting on the left. This is P.R. Hoffman. And lapping on the right. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about lapping. When we take that piece of rough cut crystal, we now need to get that to a very specific thickness or, or mass and we need to do a great deal of precision, a couple millionths of an inch, which is smaller than human hair. Okay? So it's, it's finished very accurately. Now, one thing that's interesting about the crystal industry, it employed a lot of women, but they were only allowed to do certain jobs. But they got paid the same as a man that did the job. So they were a little bit ahead of their time. <laughs> now, these are obviously stage pictures for a marketing brochure. But this is P.R. Hoffman. And apparently the work uniform, it's like IBM, but in an industrial setting, was white t-shirts. Because okay, everybody in every picture has white t-shirts on. But the men did the cutting and the initial lapping, and when we take a look, we get down into the finishing, that tended to be work that was done by the female workforce. They produce a variety of, of different materials. This is a probably 1960s, 70s vintage. Um, but just to give you an example of how those larger pieces are cut down into smaller pieces, and a crystal today is going to be probably smaller than a fingernail, maybe even a little bit smaller than that. I'm kind of asking a question, Jim. Um, so that we keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but this gives you an idea. When we talk about, there's two things that are kind of interesting. Swept crystal is they would take the crystal and they would coat the outside edges with um, gold or chromium, and they would put it in temperature and expose it to an electric current, and that would draw some of the impurities out of the crystal. That was called sweat. And seed free, there's a gentleman brought in a piece of crystal tonight. When we talk about synthetic crystal, you put a seed in, which is actually a, a wafer, a rectangular piece of crystal, and we grow crystal around that. They were actually able to, to do it in such a way that the, the seed wasn't there. I don't know about that. I would defer to somebody with more knowledge. But again, this gives you an idea. When we look at how large the buildings were, thousands of people worked at it, they worked at, at making small pieces to very specific dimensions. The finishing, as I said, was largely done by the female workforce. And you know, I even hesitated to post the ads. Now, in the 1940s, these were socially acceptable. Okay, I, I wouldn't suggest that we do a newspaper ad like that in today's world. Um, but um, anything that caught me, took good nerves and precision, um, the females got those jobs. Okay, so talk a little bit about how did, we, how did the crystal industry come to call out? Anybody heard the story? Well, the story you heard is not totally accurate, so let me back up and tell you what I know. The person that Carlisle owes the origin of the crystal industry to is a young lady by the name of Mabel Hoffman. Mabel went to nursing school at Carlisle and then went to Paula Clinic 
And a friend of hers was from California, and after nursing school, she went to California to live with her girlfriend. Her, her girlfriend's brother had a farm out in the Santa Cruz Valley, and she moved out there to go into nursing. Sadly, her friend dies a year or two later from appendicitis. But while Mabel is out there, she meets a gentleman by the name of Grover Hunt. And I'll talk more about Grover in just a minute. But Mabel marries Grover, and they end up, I'll explain why, moving back to Carlisle, and Hunt becomes a janitor at the college. Mabel becomes the college nurse. They live in Kaufman Hall, which is now where the library is at Dickinson College. And at the same time that they move into the college and, and, and they're there, there are students at the Tome Science Building, which is over on, on Lowder Street, Lowder and uh, West, have an amateur radio station. Remember I talked about the amateur radio station? Well, three people, Edward Millie, Charles Fenton, and Howard Bear, uh, had this amateur radio station, and they ground crystals for their amateur radio station. Now, Hunt's the janitor. He becomes aware of what they're doing trying to cut crystal. He's a chess player. So in late 1932, Hunt goes back to California with his father-in-law, Mr. Hoffman. And on the way back, they stop in Arizona at the Petrified Forest, and they bring some petrified wood back. Brother Hunt is going to attempt to cut chess players out of the petrified wood, based on his knowledge of the fact that these kids are cutting quartz crystal. Okay? That's different than the story is normally told. Hunt enlists the help of P. Reynolds Hoffman, who is Mabel Hoffman's brother, P. R. Hoffman. And Hoffman helps Grover Hunt cut petrified wood. Well, his petrified wood experiment fails. Grover has now been introduced to these students who have been cutting crystals. Charles Sagan helps him start to cut crystals and puts an ad in a national magazine to sell crystals. In about 1934, Grover Hunt sells crystals with the help of Charles Fagan in QST magazine. Okay? So 1932 is the first time we cut crystals in Carlisle. 1934, we have some commercial production by Grover Hunt, who's cutting crystals in the basement of Conway Hall at Dickinson College, probably without their knowledge. <laughs> oh, it gets better. And Hunt at that point, and Hunt has no experience in radio, no real interest from what I can tell, but he gets involved in crystal cutting, kind of follows the sideline, and he's aided by a couple students, guys by the name of Samuelson and Shaw and Westy, names that we'll hear about in a minute. But Carlisle got its crystal industry because Mabel Hunt went to California. I'm going to sneak ahead and I'll come back to Mabel in just a minute. But the crystal industry in Carlisle really starts in 1938. P.R. Hoffman, uh, Grover Hunt, and Linwood Gagne partner in 1938. And they start a company called Standard Piso. Gagne and Hunt did not play well together. Both were paranoid and both thought that Hoffman was out to get them. <laughs> so Hoffman goes out on his own. Now the hero of the story, in my opinion, is P. Reynolds Hoffman, and I'll, I'll touch on that a couple times. These guys are dumb lucky. Because in 1938, 1939, in the whole United States, there were 100 people employed in the crystal industry and they made about 100,000 crystals a year. Now, as World War II starts, and the military is going to crystal-controlled radios, they need millions of crystals a month. So the government steps in, and they start the quartz crystal unit, and it has a priority second only to the development of the atomic bomb in importance. And it's been said that we won World War II in large part because we had radio crystals. Okay? I've heard other stories, but anyway. <laughs> the, the government, if, if you could spell crystal, the government would give you money and fund you and start you in a crystal business. So here we have these three guys now, and they've split, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but they're like shooting fish in a barrel. They can't lose at this point. And they were going to have some success in the crystal industry, largely supported by the government. They were just Nothing replaces dumb luck. 
Now, the other thing that Carlisle contributes, and it's sizable, is the lack of machine. And tradition has it that Grover got a vision while he was watching Gone with the Wind at the Cumberford Theater, and that's when he invented the lapping machine. The truth is, especially if you talk to and, and listen to Mr. Hoffman's account, they tried dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of experiments. They drew thousands of sketches on napkins and drank one total quantities of beer trying to figure out how to do this. <laughs> Interestingly, Hunt gets the patterns, but Hoffman makes all the machines. And Hunt never contested Hoffman's production. There were never any legal battles over the patent. Now, Hunt holds the patent. He renews it in the 1960s. It's still called the Hunt Hoffman lap machine. So, they're, they're, but this is why, and there were other people that came up with the same idea, parallel coincidental thinking, it's called. Um, they came up with the same idea, but this allows the crystal wafer to be machined very precisely. Prior to this, each individual piece of crystal was ground by hand. A person would take their stone and put it on a grinding surface and move it with their fingers to the point that their fingers would bleed, and they would test it, then they'd grind it. This allowed us to do multiple, get it very close, and it's going to allow mass production. So that was Carlisle's significant contribution. We continue to make those machines in, in Carlisle. All right, I'll try and keep this appropriate, but there's some interesting stories to me here that I think will I'll tell. Grover C. Hunt. Now, some accounts say that Grover Hunt was a graduate of Stanford University and taught college. Neither are true. It's stated that he was related to the Hunt brothers of Ketchup fame. Nothing to support that. Hunt was, well, he was in World War I in the California National Guard. He was involved in horseplay at the camp, fell and broke his skull, and after several months in the hospital, was discharged from the National Guard. So yes, he served in World War I. That was his service. He, the story says that he was in an auto accident, and that's where he met Mabel. He was hiking in the Santa Cruz Mountain, fell in and broke his collarbone, and that's where he met Mabel. He, his parents had a fruit farm. Apparently he worked there. He took over a gas station in late 1925, and in, Early 1926, they moved to Carlisle, and another guy takes over the gas station and it prospers. So, tell me what happened. Mabel had to move home with the son and her, her daughter and then two sons. So he comes to Carlisle in 1926. As I said, he goes to work for the college and um, goes from there. The second person that's involved in our story at the beginning is Linwood Gagne. Some people say Gagne, but Gagne is apparently the way you pronounce it. Now, I'll tell you this story. If, if he was a, a radio operator, an amateur radio guy, like all many of the early pioneers, he was a Indian radio operator. He was in Cuba, and he helped establish the radio systems for Pan Am Airways. And then he goes to work for the Goodyear Rubber Company, and they're blimps, and he puts the radios into blimps and sets up radio stations. He's, he's quite the guy. And he ends up out in Iowa somewhere, and at some point he comes to Carlisle, there's a story about alcohol and a binge, and I think the story got confused in the telling, but that's how he gets to call out. Okay? Now, if you search his name today, you go into Google and you type in Linwood A. Gagne, you will come back on a, a case, a court case, that established case law for the Internal Revenue Service. Am I okay to tell the story? Yes. Okay. Well, it turns out, Gagne apparently was fond of spirituous liquids. <laughs> Just before midnight on New Year's Eve at a local hotel, Gagne writes out a $50,000 donation to the Carlisle Hospital, the venereal disease clinic. <laughs> <laughs> and he tried to claim that on his 1944 taxes, and the IRS disallowed it on two grounds. One, the hospital wouldn't accept it for a couple months. I guess he talked them into it. And the second thing is that he never indicated there was any connection to his business and the donation. It must have been a personal interest. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, he becomes tremendously successful. He, he, he'll, we'll see here. He works Pizzo. He ends up with a thousand or more employees. He becomes one of the biggest producers of crystals in World War II. 
And apparently he runs afoul of the IRS and the excess profits tax in 1944 and has to sell out. Grover Hunt runs into the same problem. And he owns the St. Charles for a little bit, and then he gets into a manufacturing business where he's manufacturing radio-controlled aircraft control components, and he ends up, the rest of his life, he goes back to sea as a radio operator. His wife lives up on Cedar Street until the 1960s. She moves to Florida. Guy made dives in Florida in the 1970s, and his obituary makes no mention of the crystal industry. Kind of an odd, sad story, I guess. But uh, that was gone then. The third guy is P. Reynolds Hoffman. Now this guy is trained as a machinist at GE, um, gets involved with Grover and his, his petrified wood stuff. In my opinion, he's the real star of Carlisle's crystal industry. He's the guy that solves the problems. He starts his own business. He starts a machine business. He partners, as we'll see, with, with Reeves, um, Hazard Reeves, a, a, a national, international player in the, the crystal industry, and starts Reeves Hoffman. And he does a lot of neat stuff. And he puts money aside for taxes. He survives that through World War II. And he later travels the world. He'd be a, a real interesting guy. If we ever have another business incubator in Coral it should be named for P. Reynolds Hoffman. Not Murata Erie, the Japanese company that killed the crystal industry. Okay, I always wondered why we named our business incubator for, well, anyway. Um, ben Hoffman was, was a guy that was, to me, pretty interested in the story. So, anyway, back to the story, and I'll keep it clean from this point. There's, there's three early companies, Standard Piso, a little bit of confusion about when Piso started. Some say 32, some say 34, some say 38, most probably 38. Gandhi ends up here, uh, late 37, the Goodyear blimp comes to Carlisle, the sheriff and the county commissioners get to go up in the blimp, as do uh, Grover Hunt and P.R. Hoffman. I think the Gagne-Goodyear blimp connection was made late 1937, and that's, that's when Gagne comes to Carlisle. So they start Standard Piso in 34. Like I say, Hunt and, and Gagne and, and, and Hoffman split out by 39. Grover Hunt starts G.C. Hunt and Sons, and P.R. Hoffman starts, P.R. Hoffman 1938, or starts uh, Hoffman Machine. I've also seen reference to Standard Radio, but I, that's nothing to support that he traded under that name. They start out in a garage to the rear of 544 North Hanover Street. And as we talk about some of the players in the crystal industry, their World War II draft registrations and their 1950 address are 544 North Hanover Street. There must have been a boarding house at the Hoffman House for all these younger people that were in the early part of the crystal industry. So we probably have a landmark garage in our town that we didn't, didn't know about. So that's everybody okay so far? Don't waste long sleep yet. So um, that's kind of how we get to the, 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 the crystal industry in Carlisle. It's World War II really makes it go, and I'll, I'll expand on that as I go through the companies. As I said, the, the crystal radio control was second only to the atomic bomb. It got a lot of priority. The shipment of quartz from Brazil was so important that they flew all the shipments so that they wouldn't come by ship and be sunk by German U-boats. It was critical to the war effort. Couldn't fail and very successful. By the end of 1944 and by the spring of 1945, as the war comes to an end, the crystal industry, the orders from the government just drop off precipitously. And nationally, we go from about 160 companies to about 50 companies. In Colorado, we go from four down to three, and they struggle. I mean, it's the end of the war, there's a recession, it's, it's a, a difficult time. They bounce around through the 1950s. As we get into the 1950s, we start now to see the adoption of radio technology in a lot of different things. With the police department, in the early 1950s, we started, for example, the civil defense radio network across the country. Um, taxi cabs get radios, the railroads start, everybody starts to use radios. And the consumer electronics industry starts, and crystals are used in that. Crystals are used in oscillators to, to, to drive a lot of different things. They start to become used in communications, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So we see a ramping up in the business. It doesn't get as large as World War II, but they survive. And we start to see during this period some growth now. We see some expansion beyond our, our three companies will expand out. 
The problem we run into in the 1960s, our local companies are players at the national level. And even by then, we have our crystals, local crystals, and local circuits are going into military and defense applications. And we're starting, we're involved in the space program. And we're involved in consumer electronics. But we, we're, we're just big enough to be successful, but we're not big enough to be really successful. And we're not able to generate the capital locally to expand our companies into large national and international players. So what we'll see in the 1960s is a transition of ownership from the first generation owners into larger national companies. And we start to see some a, a change. It, it starts to become a big business. It starts to become uh, corporate America at that point in time. So every, every company goes through that. And it was just a matter of they needed millions and millions and millions of dollars. We couldn't generate it locally. And so we go through that, that process. And that was a lot of transition. In the 1970s were the peak years of the crystal industry locally. And there were a couple of reasons for that. The big ones were CB radios. Anybody remember CB radios? How many crystals were in a CB radio? I've been 40. It's the number I've heard. I don't know if that's accurate or not, up until a point. And the other thing is we started to make quartz crystal watches, the Hamilton Watch Company in Lancaster. So every watch needed a crystal. And at this point in time, in the 1970s, the crystal industry just explodes in, in growth. Reeves Hoffman, for example, has like 900 employees in Carlisle. It goes almost to 1,000. One company, they open a plant in Landisburg. There's a plant in McConnellsburg. There's a plan in Mercersburg because we can't get enough people in Carlisle to make crystals. That's, that's how it just exploded. And everybody's going great guns. Standard Piso had their own airplane. And they would fly crystals to like the Washington airport to go to France or where. I mean, they're just, we're, that's the big time in the crystal industry. You know what happens? For competition. And it, it, it's amazing when you look at the, the newspaper accounts and the stories. In the mid to late 1970s, crystals have become a commodity. What do I mean by a commodity? It's something that's relatively simple to produce. It's not differentiated in any way. I can make it, you can make it, he can make it. And if we go to Japan, if he can make it for 12 and he can make it for 10, they can make it for two. So we see call out time rubber, we see um, fog switch, we see the shoe industry, and we see the crystal industry in the 1970s, the late 1970s, just get decimated by foreign competition because we're making a commodity. It's something of, it's got value, but it's a low value. We're not adding a lot of value to it. And it collapses, and the crystal industry downsizes very quickly. Hundreds and hundreds of people get laid off. Those jobs never come back. The CB radio is redesigned, and they learn how to synthesize frequency somehow, again, beyond me. We go from 40 crystals to two crystals in a CB radio. So there goes 90% of our market. And other things happen along those lines. So the 1970s was a peak. So what the companies did, and when you talk to these guys, and one of the people I had the opportunity to interview was a, a gentleman by the name of Charles Jensen, who was involved in PISO. And an interesting character, and you know, I always realize when I interview somebody, they might have a tendency to exaggerate sometimes. So even if I take off 50% of what he says he did and how smart he is, he's still a very smart guy. <laughs> he also made a lot of money, um, which coincides, I guess. But what they all, all the companies did, you can see it now, you'll see some of it as we go through here, is they start to differentiate their product. And instead of saying, I'm going to produce crystal units, which are cheap and a commodity, they start to say, I'm going to produce circuits, and I'm going to start to produce things that add value. So now, instead of making just a crystal, I'll make an oscillator. An oscillator is a, a circuit that produces a, a very constant frequency. So I can do a lot of things with that. And the opposite of a, and please, if you know anything about electronics, bear with my level of ignorance here, but the opposite of an oscillator is what I would call a filter, 
where an oscillator makes a very specific frequency, a filter only allows a very specific frequency to pass. Okay? So if I have a wire and I have a telephone, two people can talk to each other at the same time. But if I have that wire and I put one conversation on, say, a thousand cycles, and I put another conversation at 2,000 cycles, and another conversation at 3,000 cycles, and another conversation at 4,000, I can get hundreds of conversations on that wire. If I need an oscillator to put it in at this end at 1,000 kilohertz or whatever cycles, and I need a filter at the other end to just pull out the 1,000 hertz signal and, and get my message off of it. So I can hook that up to wire, I can hook it up to a microwave, I can hook it up to an optic beam. So we start to get into things like that. We also, they, they start to get into things, there's a, um, as it was explained to me, a radar that can look over the horizon and acquire targets. We started to get involved in that kind of technology. We started to get in uh, the Minuteman rockets and a lot of the different defense applications. And we also got involved in a lot of um, space projects. Okay? The images that came back from the first man to walk on the moon, the stabilizing circuit for that camera relied on components that were made in Reese Hoffman. So instead of having a crystal that has $4 value or 40 cents value, we now have a circuit that we've built that we have to harden against radiation and against temperature and against a whole lot of things to take it to the moon. And I can get, I don't know, $4 million for that because it's government money, it's free, right? <laughs> and that's what we did. So part of what the crystal industry goes through in the 80s and 90s is they become a differentiated product and each company differentiates in a slightly different way, and they become highly technical, and they, they up their game, and they're very successful at it. Then we get into the 1990s, and the internet bubble, the dot-com bubble, everybody remember that? How things were gonna be in corning as an example. Um, they made glass, well, they made fiber optic, and we're going to fiber optic the world, and we're going to do all this and that. It's, I refer to it as, it's, it's similar to the Dutch toilet craze, yeah. where in the 1600s everybody invested in Dutch tulips, and then the demand for Dutch tulips fell off, and everybody, well, the same thing hit the crystal industry in Carlisle. Now, Hunt had born in the 80s, they, they're not Hunt, um, they're not Erie, left in the 80s, but by 2000s, it's all over, with the exception of Hoffman materials, Hoffman machines, and it's not McCoy Electronics at that point, it's Vectron, I think, it's morning and it becomes Vectron, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But by 2001, 2003, pretty much at the latest, there's a, a latecomer I'll talk about, innovative um, frequency control, but the bubble bursts and away goes the industry. And now Dickinson College owns most of the buildings. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we come and go. Again, we go from being the commodity where we do the, the crystal relatively low value uh, added kind of thing, where now we're space age, international, world class competitors, differentiated um, kind of things. And these guys all came up with this, and again, they're coming from national corporations with a lot of funding, but the people in Carlisle did it. And the thing that's, that's kind of interesting about the crystal industry when we talk about it is there was a lot of blue collar production, labor type activity related to the crystal industry. But with that, there was a lot of engineering went into it, product design, design and manufacturing, um, and people came from all over the world to work here. Part of the reason the crystal industry was successful, I think, in drawing that talent to the region was the quality of the town and the community that it, they came to. So it was kind of a, a symbiotic relationship um, that was, was positive for the town. Again, it was tended to be fairly quiet, but it, it, it made a significant impact, I think. Um, I didn't know, for example, people that I went to school with, Kathy Glass, and she passed away about a year ago, her father was an engineer at P.R. Hoffman. He had several patents. We'd go to church dinners with them, and he hardly talked. I mean, you know, I'd have been going, hey, I got a patent. You know, I'd be pretty excited about it, but there was just down there people that did some pretty amazing things. Okay, any questions, comments? I'll talk now about the companies. I'm trying to keep an eye on my time. I don't want to go too long. Um, Standard Piso, as I said, is our first 
it starts out with, with Hunt Bunya and Hoffman. They started out initially 544 North Hanover Street in the garage. Gagne lived at 126 Cedar Street, which is the house immediately behind the convenience store at Louder and Cedar Street. The house is, is still there. And they produced, he built an additional in the house and he started to, to, to produce crystals there. And then World War II, he built a plant. Initially it's one story and then they added a second story. You can't see it in this, but you'll see it in another slide. All these early plants were surrounded by chain link fence and barbed wire and there's guard shacks. Remember, this is second only to the atomic bomb and it's, it's technology that the other countries didn't have. Agamemnon, as I talked about, runs a foul of the IRS. His tax bill in 1944, if I read the newspaper accounts and the accounts correctly in this, this, this court case, his tax bill was $479,000. Apparently he didn't have all the money he needed to pay. Um, so he ends up selling out to a guy by the name of Fowler. Fowler was a local investor. He was involved in another crystal company, owned a gas station. He'd be an interesting person to talk about. But he sells out to Fowler and a, a syndicate in 1944. They're local people. Um, some people run the business from then forward. Um, very successful in World War II. They have a, a plant in Scranton, and I say 600, it's actually 800 people that they employed in Scranton. There were 12 male employees, the rest were all females, and they did crystal production. Um, the building still stands. It was recently converted. They were in the fourth and fifth floors of a, a, a mill building, just recently converted to apartments. 1952, it was sold to the Brown Allen Chemical Company. Fowler had some tie into the Brown Allen Chemical Company, and they were from New Jersey. Now, that to me has certain connotations when I think of a chemical company in New Jersey, but anyway, um, <laughs> apparently they were legit. They sell to the Huck Corporation, which was an electronics corporation in 1955. About that time, they also had in Carlisle a, a research institute that was located in a house where the parking lot for Lee Torque Park is now. And they claimed that they had developed a replacement for the transistor. Apparently, it wasn't successful, uh, whether it was legit or not. By my calculations, if you had invested $10 in 1952, by 1958, you would have had about 75 cents left. <laughs> so I don't know how well it went for them. And then in 1958, Standard Piso gets sold to Herman Shaw and Wallace Samuelson. Shaw and Samuelson were protégés of the Hunts and the Hoffmans at the 544 North Hanover Street location. And um, in the book, I detail one of them uh, has a pretty extensive, I think it was Shaw, uh, service in the Navy during World War II, uh, he, he was served on the yacht for um, President Roosevelt. So he's a pretty successful young man. Uh, they buy it in 1958. They initially maintained this plant and then they went down on East Pomford Street. There was a dairy. It's now a plumbing supply store. That was built by a dairy out of Africa. Um, I can't think of the name of it. But in 1958, they go down there and buy that building and convert it to crystal production and operate the other plant. They sell out to Renwell Industries in 1963. This is the point where they can't get enough money to keep expanding their business, so they reach out to bigger companies and they go to Renwell Industries and Samuelson and Shaw both play big roles in the executive leadership of Renwell Industries. And that's gonna be true for several people when they do their sellout, that they get involved in that. Then, in 1968, they're sold to the Sunshine Mining Company. And the story gets pretty interesting. Do you ever hear of the Hunt Brothers and their attempt to corner the silver market? They use the Sunshine Mining Company to do that. Well, the Hunt Brothers, when they started to do this, decided they didn't want to have anything to do with some of the other industries they had. So, their treasurer, and combined with three other companies formed PPA Industries. And that was a post <coughs> or, or precision cabinet, a metal producer, Piso, and a fence company, anchor fence company. And they formed PPA as kind of a leverage buyout. And, and Charles Jensen, who I talked about, Jensen, I uh, talked about before, he's involved in the, the buyout with Piso in 79. They operate as part of the PPA conglomerate up until 1992 and they sell out to Piso Management. It's a, an ESOP, a stock buyout, 
kind of deal. About 20 people, local people invest. They in turn in the 1960s move up to the K Street location. They're sold to Oak Industries in 1997, very fortuitous because their business is at peak value. This is the height of the telecom bubble. When do you want to sell your business? Good time. And, and they were pretty smart, lucky people. Um, Oak, which had taken over McCoy in the 1960s, as we'll talk about, was sold to Corning, or I'm sorry, they're sold to Oak Industries in 1997. Oak Industries is later taken over by Corning Frequency in 2000. A lot of the production from Carlisle moved to Mount Holly. They kept the Carlisle plant open until 2011. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it closed September 11, 2001. It was the last day of production um, at Pizzo. And now that's the event center for the car show. Um, so that's kind of Pizzo from 1938 to, to 2001. G.C. Hunt, when, when Grover Hunt starts his own business, he goes up at the end of Lincoln Street. And, and builds, this is his building. Again, notice the fence and the guard shack. And he needs more space, so he goes above Hall's Furniture, which is on the uh, northeast corner of Locust and Bedford Streets. They could watch out the back window and see who went in and out of Bessie's. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, so G.C. Hunt, Grover Hunt and Sons start Grover buys a big house and invests in a lot of property and he gets his tax bill apparently in 1944, the same as, as, as the excess profits tax. He's where he sells all that. And um, they end up in West Lowry Street. Um, he sells out in 1944, it becomes the Hunt Corporation, um, a partnership or a, a, an organization, Goltz, Burnett. Some people that had been involved in the crystal industry at the national level, I, and, and head connections. Everybody that buys the crystal company from another company just knows they can do a better job and it's, it's going to be successful. I mean, it's that optimism, the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit. So they buy it, they don't do so well. Gold dies. In 1948, Samuel Ryeski purchased it. Now, Ryeski had been a salesman for um, Hunt in the early years. He listed his address as 544 North Hanover Street. Um, pretty interesting guy. He was on borough council. He ran as a Democrat, which in the 1960s was just something that didn't happen in Carl. I know the whole council is Democratic now, but to, he, he was quite the guy apparently to be able to run as a Democrat and get elected to borough council. And he had a lot of ties in a lot of different ways to the community. Quite successful. He, again, I think runs into the, the capital limitations and just the size of the business. And in 1968, he sells out the Erie Frequency Control. Now, the Hunt operation expands over the years, and, and Peter Hoffman Machine is now in the building. That became the incubator. Um, it became more sizable than, than the picture here. 1980, that goes to, you're sold to Murata Erie. Murata Erie in 1988 sends all their production to State College. And a couple of years later, they closed State College and, and Hunts all won. P.R. Hoffman, now, again, this is to me a pretty interesting story. Uh, and I might be biased a little bit. I'm sure there's some people here that knew all these players and might feel different. But Hoffman starts out in 1938. He starts crystal production in, in 1941. And he starts out just doing blanks. He doesn't get into the finishing work, but he he's, gets into it on a contract basis during World War II. He built his initial building as a small building on the right. It still stands. The two-story part comes in the 1950s. And actually, he, about two-thirds of that building was the original building that he added on. Um, he leased space above the theater, not the current building, but the prior, th above the telephone building. He was in stock hall, he had production. He did a lot of contract work for um, Hazard Reeves uh, during World War II. And, and very successful at it. He gets involved with a number of different things in the 1940s, as I'll talk about. In 1961, he sells out to the Ecuadorian Corporation, which was a corporation controlled by the Ecuadorian government that invested in companies both in and out of Ecuador to try and boost their economy. 1963, 
The Ecuadorian corporation sells out to the Aiken Industries, which is kind of an interesting story. Aiken Industries was a management turnaround company. Aiken invented the computer. And he was like a PhD plus, and uh, just apparently relative, uh, from what I've heard, a brilliant man. I don't know if did you ever meet him or not saying, OK. Uh, but it, it's a management turnaround for 1966. They sell back to the Ecuadorian Corporation again. So that's kind of their infusion of capital. They go along pretty good until 1970. <coughs> they're sold to the Northern Corporation. And the Northern Corporation, among other things, made like guitars, Fender guitars. And it's just funny how these guys end up. It gets even more interesting in a minute. But um, then in 1981, they get sold to Amstar Technical Industries. Amstar was a sugar company. So I guess they branched out from sugar crystals to quartz crystals. And they become part of the Amstar technical products. In 1987, a leverage buyout from Amstar, some management people from Amstar, <coughs> starts Freckles Industries, which is also a sugar conglomerate and owns Hoffman. They tried for a number of years to sell. In 1991, they sell out to Jordan Stout, who's a crystal expert with a lot of ties to Russia, um, highly regarded in the industry, very successful person. He runs it. He and his, his sales manager died in an airplane crash, tragically. Um, his wife runs it for a while. And then it becomes 1997 Hoffman Materials, and in 19 or 2008, I'm sorry, it sold to Hoffman Materials LLC. Uh, Rich Floss. They, they currently own and operate Hoffman Materials LLC. They were supposed to close at the end of January. They move everything to North Carolina, but. For whatever reason, in North Carolina, people don't seem to be fast learners or we're not good teachers or something because they're still open. Um, but that will, as soon as it closes, as I understand it, be torn down and be converted into an apartment complex. So Hoffman Materials continues to operate. Uh, the machine products was sold off from um, Spreckles in 1991 to an employee group. They went out on Commerce Avenue in South Middleton Township and continued the production of uh, I'm sorry, they moved down on West High Street even before the sale. And then after the sale to the employee group, they went out on Commerce Avenue. And then more recently, they moved over to Lincoln Street in the old Hunt Building, what was the Murata Erie incubator. And in 1997, the P.R. Hoffman Machine Products Company was sold to the Amtec Group, and they continued to operate. Okay? Um, Amtec has three or four other companies that are in the electronics industry. and. Um, they continue to function very much as they, they did. Now, the early machine on the left <coughs> to a current machine from PR Hoffman Materials, PR Hoffman continues to compete at the world level with the production of machines to finish crystals, um, substrates, and wind of that, <coughs> and the finishing of a lot of other materials that are used in the electronics industry. And they continue to obtain new patents and they, they continue to exceed. I don't know that it's a highly profitable business, but they're continuing to work. And I think they have like maybe 80 employees now. Spotless building. It's, 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 it's quite an operation. Uh, quite Where interesting. Is sort of. Where is it? Uh, they're on Lincoln Street, at the end of Lincoln Street, in, in what used to be the old um, Hunt building, and then became your Erie. Erie. It's, it's kind of behind Hoffman. It's kind of, to me, ironic that the successful part of Hoffman is now in Hunt's building. And I'm, I'm sure Grover has some thoughts about that, but um, kind of interesting. Another kind of obscure operation was called out Crystal Corporation, Philip Matthews. Philip Matthews was ex-military. He had a lot of contacts in Washington. And as I said, during World War II, if you could spell Crystal, they would put you in the business. And that's what kind of happened. And John Fowler Jr. gets involved. They operate from 1942 to 1945 in an old car dealership to the rear of what used to be Botman's menswear. Okay, I know I'm showing my name when I remember that. Matthews founded Carlisle's first radio station, WLXW, in 1958, or, yeah, 1952. He sold that and became WHYL. So I didn't realize the radio station is actually a little bit over in Idaho. <laughs> Not much is in town. All right. Another kind of interesting story is Reeves Hoffman. Hazard Reeves was, in the crystal industry, was probably the largest manufacturer of crystals and 
P.O. Hoffman worked as a subcontractor to him during World War II. In 1946, they're part of the Claude Neon Corporation, which was an organization that was involved in neon signs and, and neon products. And they partnered to form Reeves Hoffman. Now, P.R. Hoffman bought the land that the, the plant was built on, and he built the building, and he ran a couple other businesses in there. There was a Cumberland Electric Company. They made transformers. They later started to make electric motors there. That became GS Electric that went up on the Ritner. Um, and he, he did some other things in that operation, but it, it was part of Reeves Hoffman. 1956, that became Dynamics Corporation of America. And they remained independent until 1997. They merged with CTS, Chicago Telephone Supply, which continues to operate. There again, they operated until 2001. Um, and, and that was the end of, of them. But at one point, as many as 900 people worked in that plant. It's also, I think, Carlisle's ugliest building, but that doesn't matter. A couple other quick ones here to touch on. Hill Electronics. Um, Bertram, Bertram Hill, in 1951, goes down into Kingstown and, and gets a garage and starts to manufacture crystals. Um, I assume that the garage was in a little better condition and a little cleaner when he started than it is now, because crystals kind of require precision and cleanliness. But he operates there for a couple years. Then he goes over to Mechanicsburg and they, they build a new building. It's now Gross's Foods. Um, part of the offices of, of Gross's Foods um, is where Hill Electronics were. He was quite successful. They grew, they added a lot, they ran out of money. Boston Capital, which his father who was an architect from Dallas, had some money in that. Um, they expanded, but he kind of outgrew. 1969, he sells to Erie Technological, which was the Hunt Operation Carlisle, and the plant was closed and everything moved to Carlisle. Hill stays in the electronics industry for a little bit locally and then moves away. Um, probably an interesting story. And then, Last but not least, and actually uh, still standing, is McCoy Electronics. Now, Luther McCoy, I, I, I would have to say, is an interesting character. Um, Very it, much so. In, in a number of levels, he liked to race stock cars and horses. And so he's, um, I'm a bit of a redneck. I think I get along with him, OK? But he's a smart, astute businessman. He starts in 1943 to form a crystal company in Carlisle. He gets a building on South Hanover Street, like 5 South Hanover Street, which used to be the AP before they consolidated all the local AP stores. He goes out and he buys all the equipment to go into the crystal industry, and he goes to the World Production Board and says, I'm all set to go, give me business. And they say, no. There aren't enough people in Colorado to make any more crystals. We're not going to let you start a business. <laughs> okay. So he sells all his machinery to P.R. Hoffman. And about a week after P.R. Hoffman gets all Huntsman, or, uh, McCoy's machinery, he starts producing crystals with it. And he finds all the people he needs. Luther didn't know the right people, apparently, or there's some politics. I don't know what the story is. But he tried, then, so he buys his time in 1952. He partners with some local investors, uh, Kutz and Coyle, and a couple other people from the, the Mount Holly area. And they start with Coyle Electronics. They um, started a building on the south side of, of Watts Street, which is no relation to me. It was named for William Watts, who had a farm there. Um, and they expand that. They, they do quite well. They, they grow, they prosper, they get into defense and a lot of specialized stuff. They continue to grow, but again, they get to the 1960s and at that plateau where we need to get bigger, but we can't get the money. So they sell out the Oak, at that time, manufacturing that becomes Oak Industries, and there's a couple other name changes, as I understand it, that, that occur um, in there. The long story short is, Luther McCoy stays involved at the executive level, and they continue to grow and prosper and do extremely well um, through even in 2000, Oak Industries at that point sells out the Corning. This is the telecom bubble. Of course, Corning is more limited wealth than that burst. In 2004, they become Vectron International. And they operate under Vectron name until 2017. They go into a company called Micro Semi, and a year later go into what they're under now, Microchip, although I still think that there's some Vectron 
in the branding, um, it, it's, it's a little bit confusing. Not that they weren't helpful with the information, but they do a lot of defense stuff, I think, and some pretty top secret hush hush stuff, too. Um, but they still have several hundred employees, very kind of quiet, laid back operation, very successful. And so Luther kind of got into the race a little bit late, got some knocks and bumps at the beginning, but he's, his, his company's still kind of cooking. So that's kind of our story. Well, I'm sorry, I got a couple more to go there. W.J. Hunt, Warren J. Hunt was the son of Grover Hunt. He was an employee of P.R. Hoffman, and he was a chemist. He largely oversaw the development of the production of synthetic quartz at P.R. Hoffman. Early in the war, World War II, the government starts attempts to grow or develop what we call synthetic quartz. And my wife came up with an analogy. It's like growing rock candy, where you take a solution of sugar and water and a piece of string, and eventually the sugar all condenses. Well, it's the same thing, kind of, in that they take a seed, which is a flat piece of crystal, put it on a rack, and they put it into an autoclave, and they're 10 to 20 feet deep. And at the bottom of the autoclave are ground up pieces of crystal and a solution, and that solution dissolves those little pieces of crystal. And through the combination of heat and temperature, the solution goes up and it grows on that seed to produce the synthetic crystal, which is of generally higher quality than natural crystal because it's been, been manufactured in controlled conditions. What we're seeing there, and these are often pictures, um, not hunt pictures, but they're pulling an autoclave. Now, Emma Wolf, who is, is a friend of mine who works at Hoffman Materials, was in charge of the autoclaves there, and he said it was just kind of a hunch when you would open that thing. If you opened it too soon, the crystal wasn't done growing. If you waited too long, the solution started to dissolve the crystal you had just grown, and you just had to have a hunch. And he was apparently quite good at it. Um, those things still exist. It's, it's kind of like a scary place when you go up there and look around that building now, but um, they still exist. But they started to grow, and Warren Hunt was a contributor in that. It was not his invention, but it, they, they perfected it. P.R. Hoffman started to grow synthetic crystal about 1960, while one of the first people to do so successfully commercially, and they had started the process some earlier than that. So again, Hoffman was kind of a leading edge kind of guy. Um, Get good people with him. Now, Hunt starts in 1965 on the Rittner Highway. He starts out with 12 autoclaves, he stands. He apparently had some health issues. 1968, he sells out to Motorola. They operate from 1999, they close the plant, gut it. 1999, Sawyer Research comes in. Sawyer Research was the company that kind of perfected the synthetic quartz process uh, for the government. They come in in 99. They apparently did some production there. I don't know that there was a lot. And in 2003, the building was sold to a farm equipment dealer. And it's, it's, it's still a farm equipment dealer. Um, the last that, that showed up was 1986, Innovative Frequency Control. John Kent and his partner, Gene Hughes, developed a way to cut crystals very, 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 very thin. And just to give you a, a comparison, when, a, a, as I understand it, for example, WHYL, their frequency is 960 kilocycles. And you get into the FM radio band, it's, it's 102 megahertz or million cycles that, that, that the crystal vibrates at. As technology improves, you get into higher frequencies so that you then get into like the 150 megahertz band. And if, if we talked about a lot of fire radios and taxis and everything in the 50s and 60s, they're in the 150 megahertz band. And it then gets a little bit higher. Well, now we're up into, as I understand it, 3200 megahertz. Some of that's done electronically rather than crystals. But the point being that if, if, as we make that crystal smaller and smaller and smaller, the frequency increases. And that allows us to create more opportunity to communicate. I'll call it bandwidth, for lack of a better word. If we hadn't increased our ability to increase the frequency of crystals, we wouldn't be able to have our society today. We wouldn't have enough frequencies available to communicate. Okay. So uh, John Kent and Hughes in his operation 
were very successful at the way that they manufactured the crystals and, and, and the frequencies. They sold out in 91, and they operated out of the Hunt building, the rear Murata Erie building, up until 94, and their plant closed. And their process continues to be used. They were in every cell phone tower in, in, in Europe, at least, and, and many in the United States. They were extremely successful, um, but they had a good opportunity, and they, they took advantage of it. Now, there's three other companies that we'll talk about that I think are interesting. My wife's laughing at me already. But Hawk and Bowen were in the crystal industry, and Mr. Hawk, who grew up with my dad and uncle, from what I can tell, lived at the 300 block of Market Street in New Cumberland. When he retired from the crystal industry, he went out and bought a bunch of equipment, and he started to make what he called legacy crystals. For example, in the 1990s, he was making the crystals that controlled the de-icing circuits on DC-3 aircraft. Not a high demand item that a place like Hoffman would make. And they operated from their house in the car until about 2000. And he sold his stuff to Edward Smith, who was in, I understand, in Carlisle, and made some crystals. And he, in 2016, sold out the Anderson Electronics, which is in Holidaysburg. And they're still in operation. And I don't remember the guy's name I talked to, but I got about a four-hour education on the crystal industry when I called out there that guy. And it was pretty interesting. I didn't put all that in the book. But, and the final thing that I got to talk about is P.R. Hoffman and his putt-putt boats. From 1945, if you see that little aluminum boat in the upper right-hand corner, what that has is a little tube in there, and there's a candle, and when you light the candle and put it in there, it heats the water in that little tube. And every now and then it puts, and when it puts, it shoots a little water out, and it draws a little water in, and the boat goes forward. They call them putt putt boats. So Hoffman gets them stamped down in the south somewhere, and he brings them up. He has a little factory up on, uh, behind his factory on uh, Cherry Street. And he, he assembles these, and he sells them. They start out for $1.86 a piece, and they improve their production efficiencies, and he sells them for a dollar, and he, he, he does pretty good with it. They now sell for $237. <laughs> That's in our collection now. Um, they didn't do well, apparently. He donated 70,000 of them to the local Salvation Army, and they gave them to Sunday school students for a couple of years after this. But I thought that was kind of interesting. And it might, of course, eBay, you can find anything on the internet. We never tried it. I don't know. You guys didn't try and float it. OK. Um, but it's in our collection. So anyway, what's left? Well. Like I said, we can kind of see the story from almost start to finish. Locally, microchip technology, they employed one crystal engineer. At the peak of the industry, there were at least 20 crystal engineers. Central Pennsylvania, maybe more. Okay, so 5%. One domestic producer of synthetic quartz. Most of our crystal oil comes from, and I did this before the event started in Europe. Most of our crystal quartz crystal comes from Russia. There's one synthetic producer left, Sawyer Labs is, or Sawyer Research. They have about 400 autoclaves, about 40 employees. Some's made in France, some's made in China, but we're vulnerable. And you would think that quartz is something that we should be able to replace, but it turns out that quartz does not play well with silicon chips. So you can't build or grow a chip and include quartz on it. And there have been some other attempts like surface audio waves and memes or whatever they're called to try and produce things that were devices or substitutes for quartz, but their accuracy is just not good so far. So until we can find a way to accurately produce reliably under a whole variety of conditions exact frequencies, we're still going to need quartz crystals. So the industry is not dead, it's just the American side of it is, is perhaps not in such good shape. So what's the legacy? Well, there's a robot up on Mars right now. There are 13 components on that rover that were manufactured by, I call it McCoy Electronics in Mount Holly. That's what our legacy is. The military is using, still using target acquisition systems that were designed and pioneered by PISA. So we're still out there. We're just not out there maybe as much as we were. Um, so that's kind of the, the high level crystal industry from start to finish. As Kara said at the start, we're interested in preserving what we can of our knowledge of the crystal industry 
locally. If you have stories and experiences and you want to write them down, please do so. If, 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 and especially if you want to, if you have or you know anybody who worked in the crystal industry, we'd like to know what it was like to work there. I, I've heard some stories. Um, what was the culture? What was the atmosphere? What was the environment? What did it feel like? The social aspects. There's not much documentation. All the pictures tend to have people that look like you and I, but there were a lot of blacks that worked in the industry and it rose to high levels. We'd like to document that because it was a community-wide industry. And good times and bad times, if you, you, it, it doesn't have to be fancily written. You'd be surprised how valuable it is for a historian 100 years from now or 200 years later to find three or four paragraphs written by somebody just off the top of their head about this is what it was like. It is amazing. So please feel free. You don't have to be a qualified. I'm not a qualified writer. I just write. Just say what you think, write like you talk. Record your experiences. If you have artifacts, we'd like to collect those. We have some, but we could always use more. Remember, we were the crystal capital of the world, and we'd like to preserve that. If you have anything to donate, and the guy, I apologize, I tried to steal your piece of crystal tonight. I thought you wanted to donate it. Um, <laughs> but we, we do have some artifacts on the display over there. And as Kara said, the oral history, if you go on to our website, the, the historical society, um, is it .org? Com. Please.com, but also GardnerLibrary.org. Yeah, GardnerLibrary.org, and you can look at some of the oral histories that we've done. We've, we've done all sorts of people, and you come in and sit down for an interview. You can talk freely. We give, can give you questions in advance. If you're not comfortable, we don't go there. I mean, but we can talk about the crystal industry and get it in our own words, and that it's, it's displayed. Um, I, I've done quite a few of those. One of the people, Jim Largent, for example, worked for the railroad and had quite an interesting interview with him. Um, if, if it goes four hours, we can break it into segments or, you know, if you know people that we should talk to, please put us in touch. We can come to your place and set up cameras there. We can distance, we can do it here. Uh, but do take a look at the Gardner Library and what's there. It, it's a shame to say, I had an uncle that worked his entire life in the crystal industry and he's dead, I would like to have asked him a lot of questions. I would like to have heard his stories. I can't go get them. And there's, there's a lot of people like that. I had an aunt that worked in the crystal industry for a number of years. I can't go talk to her anymore. So we, there's a sense of urgency to this. We, the industry's been kind of going for 20 years already, and now's our time. If we don't do it, it's, it's, it's going to be lost. And as I say, it's, it's, it's amazing but something that doesn't look important to you today looks like 100 years from now when somebody's trying to put information together. So again, my book is not the end of all or be all. It's a summary of the crystal industry, kind of a high level overview. It can be improved. We can supplement it. We maybe sold two dozen copies. So I mean, that's a bestseller for me. <laughs> um, whether we do a second edition or not, I don't know. We might sell another six copies. But um, we would like to get into a story.